over the last couple of months, uh, our family on both sides uh, has gone through a, a series of health issues. Um, it's been a difficult time for us uh, where we got uh, bad news one after the other. And, and uh, it, this, it's, this difficult time reiterated the importance of getting health checks done regularly. Um, it, it reiterated the importance of doing it. But the one thing we also realized is getting these health checks can be scary, right? More often than not, you almost don't want to know if there is something. Ignorance in some cases is a bliss. No one's looking forward, oh, I'm getting my health checkup done today and, and I'm going to feel great after it. We, we are always scared to go into one. Um, there's, if there's something we'd rather not know, it better be there, you know? But all that being said, health checks are so important for us. Uh, a known devil is always better than the one hiding in the closet, waiting to prounce out when we least expect it, right? Just as we need these regular physical health checkups, we need something for our spiritual bodies, our spiritual lives as well. And, and just like the physical ones, these are not easy ones uh, to, to go through. You know, once in a while when Taru and I have these conversations of how we are doing uh, spiritually, we don't do that often yet. We would want to grow into doing that. But once in a while when we do it, these are some difficult conversations to have when, when the truth is being spoken into you. Uh, you know, we can put up the best facade to everyone out there. But for the past 18 months, we've seen each other up close every day. And we know our ins and outs. And when we have these conversations, they are hard. So I know it can be a hard thing. Uh, but this morning, we're going to just look at Jesus and, and, and open up our hearts to him to do a spiritual health check in our, in our own hearts. Uh, the passage that we're going to be looking at is from the book of Revelation. Uh, this is the last book in the Bible where Jesus uh, speaks to uh, seven churches and, and he's, he's, he's preparing them for his coming and he's talking to them about all the things that they need to work on and it ends with a promise of his coming, right? Um, the passage that we're going to be looking at is Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. I've uh, requested Kia to read this passage for us. Over to you, Kia. Thank you. Revelations 3 verses 1 to 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from my book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of God. Amen. Thank you, Kia. Let me just pray before we start. Um, father, what we just read is, is difficult to hear, um, but we know that your heart for us is to, to, uh, to embrace us, uh, to, to address our mess, to look straight in it and not condemn us and reject us, but to, but to embrace us and transform us. And this morning, we want to surrender to your work. Holy Spirit, speak to each of our hearts at our points of need this morning. We surrender to the power of your word. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, 
here's the framework of the talk this morning. This is what we're going to be looking at. Just two things, alive or dead. And the second thing is, how do we come alive? Yeah, alive or dead, how do we come alive? Straight up, the thing that is that catches our attention from this passage is this one line which Jesus says, you have the reputation, uh, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You think you're alive. Everyone else around you thinks you're alive, but you're dead. Of course, Jesus is talking about spiritually here, and he's talking to a church, mind you. He's talking to a pretty active church. This active church probably thought they were spiritually thriving. They were doing well. They had this reputation. Jesus is saying, you are spiritually dead. Now, do we ever think of ourselves as spiritually dead or dying? To be honest, we, we probably do acknowledge that in some seasons we are not growing. Uh, we have difficult dry seasons. We acknowledge that uh, there are seasons where we, we don't do these spiritual things that we need to do regularly communing with Jesus, having our own time with Jesus. We, we probably uh, withdraw from community a bit and all of that. We acknowledge all of that, but we don't probably look at ourselves and say, hey, I am spiritually dying. And this morning, Jesus is, is, is calling our attention to this. This is probably because we don't, we don't consider ourselves, we don't think on those lines probably because we believe the primary work of the gospel is to make uh, the bad parts of us good, is to make bad people better and improve them. Well, it isn't. The primary work of the gospel is to make the dead people alive in Christ. That's the primary work. And this, this gospel, which makes the dead people alive, is time and again, time and again, preached to the church, followers of Jesus in the Bible. So when Jesus looks at us, he either sees us as people who are alive spiritually or dead spiritually. He doesn't say, okay, this person is good. This person is a little better than this guy. I mean, I think he's doing a little better. Uh, this person is not doing better. He either sees us spiritually alive or spiritually dead. So when, because we live in this good and bad reality, we often miss out on the dead or alive reality. And Jesus is calling our attention to that. How do we know we are dying? What are the symptoms? What is, what is Jesus saying? He says in, in verse one, I know your deeds. And then he goes on to expound. The first thing he says, we're going to be looking at two things, what we don't do and what we do. What we don't do and what we do. Let's look at the first thing, what we don't do. Jesus says, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. I have found your deeds unfinished. What is Jesus saying here? Uh, James, uh, a writer of a book in the Bible, he explains this when he talks to another church and he says this in James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is, if not, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So the first thing is, we know we are spiritually dying when our faith doesn't produce action. We know we are spiritually dying when our faith doesn't produce action. You know, there's a growing belief in our culture today that my faith is my personal thing. 
I don't need to show it. I don't need to talk about it. It's what I believe in my heart. Sadly, this belief has creeped into the church as well. I know that I believe. Christ knows that I believe. I, I know I do. It's okay if it's not written all over my actions. Okay, strangely enough, the same belief is not extended to our work or careers. When we are deeply passionate about it, we don't even think twice before showing it. We go all out all through the week. We don't mind putting those extra hours. We don't mind uh, working the weekends for it. And let's not kid ourselves into believing this is all because of the pressure from my boss. We love our work. And we don't mind putting in those extra hours. It translates into action. Our deeds show it. It's a natural outflow. We don't think twice before making sacrifices. You know, in July, I saw this news um, where this, this wedding was going on and upon the wedding mandap, the groom was working, finishing some office work on his laptop. On the mandap, the bride smiles and then he finishes his work and gives the laptop back. And the caption says, welcome to weddings in 2021. Right? If not anything, this season has brought out what we love the most and what we want to do the most when we have all our time to ourselves. When it comes to our love for work, we are not afraid for it to show in our actions. So why is it? That when it comes to our love for Jesus, we are not okay making those sacrifices. We are not okay telling our bosses, hey, today I have something, I need to be there. We're not okay doing this. The only possible, plausible explanation for this is probably the spiritually dead state that we are in. That is why Jesus is saying, you may think you're alive, but you're dead. Let's let that hurt us for a moment. Our actions, our faith is not going into our actions. Jesus says, I find your deeds unfinished. The second thing, that's the first thing we know we are dying when, when our faith doesn't translate into actions. The second thing is by what we do by what we do look at verse 4 jesus says yet you have a few people in sardis who have not soiled their clothes that implies that most people in sardis have soiled their clothes soiled their clothes doesn't just mean sinners or people who do immoral things because all humans are sinful and, and this, this, this passage says there are some who haven't soiled their clothes. So what does this mean? It means that the people who have soiled their clothes are the ones who have become comfortable living in their sin or living immoral lives. People who have become comfortable with their sins. We don't see the seriousness of it anymore. It's just how life is nowadays. We have become comfortable and have gotten used to wearing these soiled clothes. So we know we are spiritually dying when we have become comfortable with sin and we don't feel the need to repent. We don't see it as a life or death issue anymore. We find reasons to justify it. We have our own terms and conditions apply on these specific things in the pages of the Bible. Hey, this is for, for that culture. It is not for my culture. 
if only god knew the culture that i was in if only god knew the kind of work pressure i face nowadays if he only knew my struggle it's not relevant to me anymore friends any sin that we've become comfortable with it is comfortably killing us any sin that you become comfortable with you know the sardis church they also lived in a culture they also lived in a culture which made it extremely easy for them to be comfortable with their sin this was a wealthy city because of its geography and its access to trade routes um there was access to easy money and luxury it was also known for its loose and permissive moral culture especially sexual in nature there was a large temple and uh, and the mother goddess was called sibyl and this mother goddess was honored and worshiped with all kinds of sexual immorality and impurity so the combination of easy money and loose morality made the citizens of sardis notoriously soft to immorality hey don't we see that in our cities today especially the mega cities haven't we become soft to immorality in our own hearts today kevin d young a writer for the gospel coalition um he he writes this article called the world is catechizing us whether we like it or not and then in that article he says this something really powerful he says the money power and prestige of the mainstream media big time sports big business big tech and almost all the institutions of education and entertainment are invested in making sin look normal we know this it's almost impossible to find a show on netflix that doesn't glamorize things that bible clearly calls sin and here's the thing when 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 sin starts to look normal in our lives righteousness starts to look strange and outdated how is that happening we know of the number of touchy subjects that even in the christian world today that will put some of us off and offend us when we call it sin as the bible rightly calls us and asks us to these are areas where our hearts are convinced that there can be nothing wrong about it even though the bible talks about it clearly as sin and here's the thing guys this is what i realized for myself even though i recognize some things as sin when it comes to my own recreation time i find myself wanting to binge on this content which glamorizes all of this much more than any content that that shows my heart to how beautiful christ is so i and guilty of soaking myself into this culture which is bent upon softening my heart to immorality friends this is us in soiled clothes and we become comfortable wearing them and jesus is declaring us dead this morning is declaring this church dead you might have a reputation of being alive but you are dead so what is the first thing jesus is telling these people he's telling wake up wake up wake up to the deadness of your souls wake up and see sin for what it is in your lives 
only people who are awake can tell that they were sleeping a sleeping person will never say i am sleeping right now only when he wakes up will he say oh i was sleeping until now so jesus is waking us up today to the deadness of our sins let's move on to the next thing how do we come alive how do we come alive what is jesus telling these people he says in verse 3 remember therefore what you have received and heard hold it fast and repent remember therefore what you have received and heard hold it fast and repent jesus is calling this church to repent because just as we've discussed up until this point ongoing repentance is a sign of a thriving spiritual life and there is no two ways about it i cannot i cannot fake it by being more active in church i cannot fake it by being more kind to people ongoing repentance is the sure sign of a thriving spiritual life and jesus is asking this church to repent I know we talk about it a lot at New City, but familiarity can sometimes breed contempt. So let us look at this repentance with fresh eyes this morning. What Jesus is asking them to do when he says "remember" is he's asking them to come spiritually alive. We become spiritually alive by repenting in the present, by remembering the past, and remembering the future. we become spiritually alive in the present by repenting by remembering the past and remembering the future let's look at the first thing remembering the past what is jesus asking them to remember here what is it that they have received what is it that they have heard it is the good news of jesus his life his death and his resurrection This is the gospel that is preached again and again to saved believers to saved followers. Why is it that we need to remember? Isn't it a simple truth? Why is it that we need to remember? Because only when we remember each and every detail of it it leads us into true repentance. Hey, let's be honest for a while here. more often than not our repentance tends to look like this today this is my mess i acknowledge it i own it this is who i am but i'm accepted despite my mess i'm accepted despite my mess while this is true this is not the whole truth because this is not the gospel truth even netflix is preaching this truth to us no matter who you are no matter how messed up you are you are accepted you are loved experience this love this is half truth guys this is a spin off of the gospel the gospel truth is i am accepted despite my mess because jesus died for it but in repentance i begin to hate my mess and war against it because jesus defeated its power by his resurrection that is true repentance i begin by owning it and saying this is who i am but i don't stop there i go on to disown it and say but this is not who i am in jesus today that is true repentance when we when we stop in the first part we are diluting repentance we 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 don't see its life giving power in our lives while the world is busy glamorizing our struggle and helping us make peace with our mess the gospel helps us to make war with our mess and come out as victors 
the gospel tells us that the very sin that you are struggling with today the very sin that you don't want to talk about and want to take it to your grave can be defeated because jesus died for it and rose from the grave hey when we don't see this full truth when we don't remember this full gospel our repentance tends to become shallow so what is your repentance looking like today is it beginning by acknowledging the sin is it then going on to hate the sin and war against it are you experiencing power over us and many times i struggle with it i ask myself why do i keep struggling why do i keep struggling and i realized because i never warred or started to hate my sin i still love it in my heart i enjoy it too much repenting by remembering the past the second thing is repent by remembering the future let's look at this verse jesus says in verse 5 the one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white i will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels what is jesus doing here jesus is empowering this church at sardis by assuring them of their salvation he's saying you will be victorious because your name is already in the book of life i promise never to blot it out and because i will never blot it out you will be victorious today what is he doing he's assuring us of victory today because we are not fighting for a place in the book of life we are fighting from the place of having our name already in the book of life that's the assurance that's the glorious truth which has power to change our lives today in the here and now how will remembering the future impact us today how will it help us make these diff- difficult decisions allow me to illustrate this for us i am reminded of the movie the avengers infinity war right there's this particular scene when when thanos is is he's gathering almost all the stones and and doctor strange who has the time stone and uh, iron man are going to fight him and before going to this war uh, doctor strange tells iron man if it ever comes to choosing between my time stone and you i will let you go i will sacrifice you but when the moment comes for war when they are fighting in the midst of battle Doctor Strange uses his time stone to look into the future and see millions of possibilities and see only one in which they will win the end game and that involved parting with his time stone and saving Iron Man's life in that moment when he looks into the future that's the only thing that gave him the power to part with his time stone in the present and surrender it hey as christians we have this incredible gift it is not just a made up movie it is the truth that we know of our glorious future it is not a calculated risk it is not a a a, a hopeful speculation it is a absolute truth that we know of this glorious future with christ when we are devoid of any sin when we are made absolutely perfect just as christ is and knowing that future thinking of that future must help us today to make these tough calls and hate the things that we dearly love which are killing us comfortably on the inside i know that passages like this can make us feel condemned when i read it i, I was like ouch jesus couldn't you say it in better words like what is happening 
Ouch. But when we read this chapter in context, friends, we see that this is a risen Jesus. This is an ascended Jesus who came and paid the bride price to be betrothed to you and I on the cross. And who went back home to his father to prepare a place for his bride in the home. This ascended Jesus is looking at his bride and saying, hey, these are the things that you need to work on. These are the things that will make you more and more radiant. These are the things that will make you more and more beautiful. This passage is not meant to condemn us, but it is meant to convict us, to prepare us, to beautify us for our bridegroom. Friends, I don't know what it is that you are struggling with today. I don't know what it is that your heart dearly loves, that, that you can't yet begin to see as sin. I don't agree. I don't know what is it that you can't agree with the Bible on when it calls about sin. I don't know what is it that has made your heart feel comfortable towards, that has softened your heart towards it. I don't know what is it. But this morning, would you allow the truth, the glorious truth of Christ what happened on that cross and what is going to happen in, in, in heaven? Would you let these glorious truths make wage war to our sinful hearts today in the present? Would you repent this morning? Allow me to just pray and bring this time to a close. Could we just quiet in our hearts? Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you because you are right now waiting with open arms, waiting for us to come, to even look at you, for you to come running, clothe us, just as this passage says, clothe us in robes of white, in robes of Jesus' righteousness. Kiss us and say, this is my son, this is my daughter. This morning, we want to pray that prayer. Would you help us to hate sin? Would you help us to hate sin? Would you birth in our hearts a desire to see and embrace the beauty of your holiness? Would, would you help us? Would you help our faith to show in our actions? Would you help it to change everything about our lives? Help us, Lord. We repent. We come broken and messed up. We repent. We repent. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen.